Life Church created this podcast because we all need healthy conversations with real people. So this podcast is here to help you start conversations with your life group, friends, and family. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the You've Heard It Said podcast. This is Allie. And this is Jason. And Allie, I have a game for us today. Okay. Would you like to know what it's called? I don't know. Should I ask you what it's called? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> What's it called? Oh, it's called Crisis. No, I'm not the right person for this. I'm really bad in a crisis. Here's how it goes. I'm going to give you a crisis scenario. Okay. And then you simply just have to explain. <laughs> simply? Yes, oh. just, you just explain exactly what you would do in that scenario. Um, you could do this. Okay. Okay, crisis number one. You see a bear. What do you do? I, I don't know if I saw a bear. I would freak out. I don't know. <laughs> I've only ever seen them at the zoo before. I've never seen one in the wild. I really don't know Like if I would be the person that's like flight or freeze. Or I, I do know I would not fight it. Okay. That's, that's for sure. So crisis number two. You are stranded on a desert island. How do you stay alive? Oh, okay. Well... I guess you're like supposed to find water that's not ocean water because then yeah. it's like salty. So yeah. you just get more thirsty. And then I think you're supposed to find like plants and stuff <laughs> to eat. So I guess you see if there's plants, but not poisonous ones. So I don't know. And then I guess you write help in the sand so uh, that like an airplane would see you and maybe come get you. That was pretty good. Here's crisis number three. Hmm. A hostage negotiator quits their job. <gasps> no. And you are the only person who can replace no. them. In the middle of some kind of, you know, crisis. So what do you do? This one really makes me nervous. I I have heard that you're supposed to, like, humanize yourself. So I guess you, like, go up to them and you're just, like, super calm. Like, yeah. hey, person, you don't want to do this. Like, <laughs> we're cool, right? Like, <laughs> everything's going to be okay. I don't know. I guess you just try to, like, I bet you I would handle know. it really well, Allie. I don't know. No, I'm <laughs> serious. All of us are at some point going to face some kind of crisis and we usually either feel like, I have no idea how I get through it. Like we're afraid of crisis because we have no idea what we do. Or even worse than that, we think, I'm fine. I can handle it on my own, right? So these are things like we should be thinking about. And so here's today's big questions. What do you want to be true of you and the way that you lived your life in the middle of a crisis? And how can you both receive and give support to others in times of crisis? Mm, those are big questions. So we've got this story that I think is actually going to help all of us. My friend Adrian, uh, I was talking to him several weeks ago, and he, he starts telling me about what happened. Last Christmas, he's with his whole family on Christmas Eve. He's given one of his kids a bath, and he starts to realize that he probably has a case of COVID-19 mm -hmm. in a house full of people. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he's totally okay now. But his story is one that I think is going to help all of us process what we've been going through for the last year and give us some good ideas about how to move forward. Adrian, welcome to the You've Heard It Said podcast. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity and for having me on here. Yeah. Okay. So season five of our podcast, this season that we're in, we're talking all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this morning I opened up my old man social media app <laughs> and I don't know if like the social media gods knew that I was going to hang out with you today or what, uh -huh. but like you, a video of you shows up and it's this one. I'm going to play it. Okay. Happy so there's like a fire pit behind you and a birthday cake in front of you. Obviously, we know what everybody's singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and kids and people of all ages. Tell me a little bit about what's going on in that video. Yeah. Why is there so much joy on your face in the video? Yeah. <laughs> Why is there so much joy in your face right now? Like, who yeah. are these people? Yeah, so that's my family. That's, you know, my wife and three kids and my parents and my brother and his wife and their kid. Okay. And so we all got together as a family. One of the things that we always try to make a point of is to celebrate people's birthdays. And so like coming together to celebrate that, I think is kind of one thing that we've always done. And so in that video, my daughter is before 
she comes out to me and she says, okay, dad, do you want cha-cha-chas on your birthday or do you want no cha-cha-chas? <laughs> And I'm like, I want cha-cha-chas. And so in the video, she starts singing and I lean over to her and I was like, hey, don't forget the cha-cha-chas. Yeah. And so then she picks up on it. And then the the funny part about the video is my three-year-old and my five-year-old are so competitive. (laughs) And and so my five-year-old comes up to me and she says, hey, can I help you blow out your candles? And I'm like, sure, that's fine. And so we get to the very end of the song, and before the song is over, in the video, you see my three-year-old just come out of nowhere and blow all the candles <laughs> out. <laughs> and then my five-year-old realized what's going on, and then she tries to, like, compensate, yeah. which then leaves me with, like, literally no birthday candles to blow out. So, so, so yeah. many great people around you. Such a happy moment. Mm-hmm. Would you describe for me what people yeah. have added to your life in this last year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about everything that I've been through this past year, there have been so many people in my life that have probably have taken care of me in a way that have shown like just a a deep appreciation and love towards me that I don't just like felt like it resonated more. Like, Like it made me really sit back and think about like all the things that like I'm grateful for in this time and in this period of my life. People were with you. Mm -hmm. People supported you. Mm -hmm. People appreciated you. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, I think this is going to be a really great conversation. Yeah. Because we want to talk about the types of things that people add to our life. And one of the reasons that we've been talking all about relationships this season is because of the fact that, like, this last year has been crisis Mm -hmm. for so many people. I'm just curious, how have relationships impacted you specifically going through the pandemic? I mean, for me— there was a time when everything kind of shut down. If we think back like to last March and we were all kind of in this shelter in place and it broke us up of all our routines. The thing that I noticed that I found myself doing and that also found was being reciprocated was taking the time to reach out to people that maybe I hadn't talked to in a while. Yeah, Mainly just like sending a text message of like, hey, how are you doing today? And I would get it too. And what's interesting is that like it made me think about like, I don't really necessarily need like a pandemic or anything like that to happen in my life to make sure that I reach out to this person that I hadn't talked to in a while. Yeah. And so I think it made me be more intentional with like relationships and talking to people. And and it also made me think about like maybe people that didn't have families and stuff, like made sure that I thought like of, of them as well. And how can I reach out to them and talk to them? Yeah. As things progressed, I found myself needing relationships more than ever at that time when I got sick. And so like during that time, there was a lot of people that were, I couldn't have gone through what I went through without those relationships. Yeah. Tell me more about that. What did you go through? Yeah. So it was towards the end of the year. It was probably about December 12th. I think if I remember the exact date, I woke up and I just wasn't feeling myself. So I immediately went and got a COVID test because that's the first thing you think of. It's like, oh my gosh, I need to make sure I don't have COVID, right? Right, You got to roll it out. Like my macaroni and cheese tastes weird. I need a COVID test. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I went to the doctor, got a COVID test and it came back negative. And I was like, all right, that's that's ruled out. And then I uh, actually tested positive for the flu. And so I was like, okay, well, I've had the flu before. So I went home, rested about three, the five days went by and it was right the week before Christmas. And so now we're faced with this dilemma of my family. Like every year we get together for Christmas. It's like one of those things that we do. And and now I'm faced with like, well, do I go back and see them? Do I wait a couple right. extra days? Yeah. And so what ended up happening is that I started to get better. My fever broke and I thought, you know, I was done with the flu. Yeah. So we, we left. It was like December 22nd. We traveled, went to go see some family. And then on the 23rd was my father-in-law's birthday. Mm -hmm. And every year for his birthday, we do like a really big thing because it's right next to Christmas. But that day I just started feeling terrible again. I was Mm. just like, all right, something's not right. So I was kind of isolating myself in a room away from the whole family. And then I'm thinking in my head, like tomorrow we're supposed to go to my parents' house. Yeah. So we're staying with my in-laws. We're supposed to go with my parents. And then I remember calling my mom And at this point, I had been sick for probably like seven days. And I had never been sick for that long. And I was on the phone with my mom and I was just having like a really hard time. And I was really emotional. I was like, I don't think we're coming. Like, Mm, and and I felt so bad because one, I had to break that promise to her. Two, I wasn't getting better. Right. And three, like I knew like she really wanted to see the kids. And so, so we ended up not going there. And then on Christmas Eve, I went to give my son a bath. And at that point, 
I was so labored and breathing when I was giving my son a bath. It's just like something's not right. I'm not getting better. Yeah. I actually feel like I'm getting worse. Yeah, you're a couple weeks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I call I call the doctor, and he could tell like my breath and stuff was was really labored. And so he's like, you need to go to the ER. Mm. So at that point, we're staying with my you know in laws at their house. My brother and sister in law are there. They're they're kids, and my father in law turned to him and says, I think I need to go to the ER. Yeah. So what were you thinking was wrong? At that point, I, I thought I, I had COVID. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I, I looked to my father-in-law on the day after his like birthday, right? And I was like Christmas Eve, I need to go to the ER. And so he he took me and it's like, we go to the ER, we drive like an hour because where they live, that's like the, you know, one of the closest hospitals. So, hey, father-in-law, you want to come hang out in the car for an hour I know. with somebody who might have COVID? <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah. And this is kind of where I'm like, I feel like I'm so blessed because now, thankfully, like everything turned out okay, but he put his life at risk to take me to the hospital. Yeah. And he knew that there was a chance that I had COVID. Yeah. And so, and this is what I'll never forget. And like, I'm so thankful for it. But like when we were driving down there, I just looked at him and said, I really think thank you for taking me to the hospital. And he's like, don't worry about it. It's just, that's what we do. Hmm. So I go to the hospital, I get some x-rays in my lungs and they start to see them developing pneumonia. And at that point they're like, you're not going home. So they take me off into a room. My father-in-law goes home. They give me another COVID test. Yeah. And at that point, that's when I text my wife and, and, and I tell her, I was like, I have COVID. Oh man. And then, so she was like, okay, get ready. Cause now Everybody that was in that house, which includes my three kids, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my brother yeah. and sister-in-law, their three kids, like we're at a, you know, we have to deal with this event that's happened. So I go through that, that process. I'm in the hospital for, for 18 days recovering. Dude, 18 uh, days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was that like? The first probably 48 hours to 72 hours, it was hard because in my mind, like I'm thinking I have COVID, I've just exposed my family to COVID and I'm having trouble breathing and I'm on oxygen. Right. And the, the, the problem was it's like hyperventilating, right? So you mm. can't catch your breath, which makes the situation worse. So like psychologically, I'm like in my head, I'm thinking I just need to calm down, but I can't because I'm almost having like anxiety and panic attacks mm. because I can't breathe. So anyway, so I'm sitting here and once I get past that little window, that 72 hour window, and I realized I'm going to be okay. But now I'm in a room isolated without anybody. Like it's just by myself. Nobody. Nobody. And the doctors that come in are all in like almost like full hazmat suits. And they're only there for like less than 30 seconds. So for the next two weeks, I have like no human interaction in a room by myself. I have like no physical contact. And that was probably the hardest part of the whole thing. Obviously, I was extremely lonely. It was extremely hard not being able to be with my kids on Christmas morning, not being able to be with my wife on New Year's Eve. Yeah. And so the closest thing that I had, you know, interaction-wise was like I was up in a hospital and I would just tell my wife, come to the window so I could see you guys. But I was five stories high. So they were off in a field that was probably like 50 yards away. And they're looking at the window and they're like, where are you, Adrian? And I'm like, well, here I had like these bright yellow socks from the hospital. Yeah. So I took them off and I started waving them in the window. <laughs> and I'm like, here, can you see it? And I'm like on the phone, like, can you see it? And they're like, they look at me and they're like, yeah, yeah, there you are. And then I see my kids and my, of course, my daughter's holding a little sign, you know. Yeah. And, but I mean, it was tough, man. It was really, really hard. It was like time moved very still. But at the same time, that two weeks went by really fast. It was, it was yeah. crazy. So you've got this like, boot camp level experience with crisis mixed with isolation. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the last year that everybody went through. Yeah. You got like a concentrated version of it for Christmas. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so how are you doing now? Uh, I mean, I'm doing much better, thankfully, but like I have like a, not to say that I didn't have like an appreciation for relationships, Yeah. but like now I value and see that relationships are so much more important. Was there some moment that, that made you think that or like, how did you get to that point? So what I've realized, and this is another thing I felt like God really showed me through that time when I was in the hospital is that there's something about like when you're at like a really low point in your life that you feel like you can talk to people about things that you wouldn't normally talk about, right? Yeah. Like in a normal lunch conversation, you may not talk about like 
like a deep topic or whatever. Yeah. So I found myself having conversations with people and family members that I probably wouldn't have had a conversation about. Like I found myself saying, I love you to people that I probably yeah. hadn't talked to, you know, in a while. It's like when I realized that God showed me that, like I was almost using this as an opportunity to encourage other people, right? Yeah. And so that was just like one of the weird things about being in that situation that that provided it. And then, of course, too, I had people checking in on me just to see how I was doing because word was starting to spread that I was in the hospital. And for about 90% of people that I know, like when they think of who's the the person that has COVID the, the worst case, like I'm the person that comes to mind, right? Yeah. So then I, I began to think about like how God, like how can you use this to help bring people together? And then also God, how can you use this to to direct people to, to you? Because yeah. ultimately what's been crazy to see too is that like somebody on my birthday, right? Recently on my card, you know, I got a birthday card. And in the card they said, every time I see you, it's a reminder of God's faithfulness because of how he healed you. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, that's amazing, you know, to think about. But then too, it's like, how can I help other people see that yeah. as well? So, so You're like, that, man, I'm just the guy with the yellow socks on the fifth yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, I look back and I'm like, I, it was such a terrible thing for anybody to have to go through, whether it's the sickness or whether it's isolation. Yeah. But I feel like God showed me a lot of things and used that opportunity to to build relationships with people. Yeah. And then also to, to just work on things within myself. So you, you're, you're recovered from the sickness, right? I yeah. Mean, like you're good. Mm-hmm. And your lungs are better. Right? Yeah. Do you feel like you have also recovered from that experience with loneliness? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, there's times I think back, you know, to certain situations and I'm like, it brings something up within me that I'm reminded of what that, period felt like. Yeah. I don't want to ever to to feel that way again. Right. So I want to make sure that like I'm one intentional about my time with relationships and with people because I don't want to, I don't want anybody to feel like that type of loneliness and I don't want to feel like that type of loneliness. And I think the only cure to that is probably relationships, right? It's like, how do I connect with people in a way where I'm vulnerable enough to know them and they get to know me and then at the same time, too, we have that mutual relationships where we're there together. And I think that's a big key because, yeah. yeah, I mean, otherwise it's like, it can be sad. I mean, it was hard. So for somebody who can identify with some of the loneliness you experienced, mm-hmm. you don't want them to experience that, right? right? What are some things you've learned, just practical things you've learned about how to step out of it? And whether it's things you can do or things other people did for you, Talk to me about some of that. One, I think you have to make a decision, right? Like, and I know it's hard because it, it takes some work on your end. Yeah. Uh, it takes work on, on, on two parties' ends, really. And, and I think you have to be okay with, like, with sharing maybe some of your stuff. Like, oh, I'm struggling with this. You know, there is a little bit of that vulnerability. To put it in perspective, like, this wasn't always something that came naturally. Like, the level of, like, relationships and commitment and, like, talking to people, like, wasn't something that just happened overnight. Because I think there's a fear that that I had, you know, over the last 15 years or so, that, like, if I say something to someone and I open up to someone in a way that makes me vulnerable, either yeah. A, it won't be reciprocated, or B, they won't value it, right? Right. And so there's that fear. But I promise you, like, the... The type of connection and community and relationships that happens on the other side of that fear is so much worth the risk. And I think that's when when people are in this spot, and this was for me, you're in this spot of like, well, I want to get over this loneliness, but I'm afraid to share about my stuff, or I'm afraid to share what I'm going through. So therefore, that's going to hold me back. And then at that point, you don't take that risk, but then you don't get rid of the loneliness. Yeah. So there's that work that has to go involved. And if anybody doesn't believe that there's a benefit on the other side of the risk. Maybe I just need to play the happy birthday song again. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, just looking at, at the people in your life and the way that you've you've invited them to be in your life, yeah. it's like so obvious to me yeah. that this is worth it. Absolutely, yeah. There is going to be those times where, like, you'll still get hurt. But I, I, I think there's so much, like, to it, to having that authentic community and relationships in your life that supersede any sort of fear that might— keep people from stepping into that, you okay. know? So be vulnerable, be willing to share things that might be difficult to share, take the risks, 
Anything else that you've learned? I have a friend that's really good at relationships. And so I was talking to him and we've been friends for a long time. And he was one of the guys that really like encouraged me and reached out to me when I was in the hospital. Learning from him some things that you can do is he's super intentional about it to where he'll put in down important dates. Like he'll ask me, like I like we'll check in about once a week with each other through text. Sometimes that conversation leads to a 30 minute call or a 30 minute text conversation. Sometimes it's just like 30 seconds. Yeah. But one thing that he does that I've always thought was really good is if I mention something in that conversation, like a date or an event, he'll put it in his calendar and then he'll follow up with me mm. on that time, on that date, and just say, hey, just let you know I'm praying for you. Yeah. Like that, to me, I was like, man, that's like relationships to like level 10. Yeah. Like how can I get better? Let's notice people. Notice people. Pay take, attention. Pay attention. Okay, the last question I want to ask you. Yeah. It's one of my favorite questions that our other host, Allie, like always asks people. Okay. What's one thing that you know about God now Uh that you didn't before you went through all of this? Oh, man. (laughs) So I think this was something that I was reminded of. So I've I've heard Pastor Craig talk a a lot about this, and I've, I've experienced it in times in my life, and it's been a long time. But for some reason, I don't know why— but you, I felt so close to God when I was at my lowest point in my life. Yeah, in the hospital, hooked up to oxygen tubes, not being able to breathe on my own, not being able to, you know, like carry on a full conversation like this. But yet there, I felt like God, His presence was just. I was like full of it, like His love. It makes me think of like the next time something bad happens. Yeah, and it's kind of weird to think about it, but it's like oh, could I go through another trial like that so I could feel closer to God? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But no, I don't want to go through another yeah, trial no, like no that. No, thanks. Do you think it had anything to do with the fact that you just couldn't make it work on your own? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's, pro- there's probably some of that in there too. So it's, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. But yeah, I mean, I think that was one thing I was reminded of is just when you can be so dependent upon God at your lowest point, like how can I create that type of dependence throughout, you know, like yeah. you don't need a low point to have that. It reminds me of what you said about building relationships. Absolutely. It's yeah. like lead with some vulnerability, need people and, and let yourself need people. Here's what's happening in your brain. The late scientist Bruce McEwen from Rockefeller University defines stress as the brain's effort to resolve uncertainty. Enter COVID-19 and hello, uncertainty. The problem is the kind of stress a global pandemic brings is really expensive for your body. The brain takes up 20% of your body's overall activity. And if it doesn't get what it needs, it will zap energy from your other organs. So when our brains are in a constant state of stress or uncertainty, it's bad news for our minds and our bodies. In fact, when exposed to prolonged periods of stress, here's a few not so fun side effects that can result fatigue, sleep disruptions, irritability, and lack of energy. In addition, stress produces a hormone in the body called cortisol, which can be toxic to your nerve cells. One effect of this is that your brain stops using its prefrontal cortex to make decisions, which is the rational and logical part of your brain that really should be making your decisions. And instead, your brain starts using the amygdala and the basal ganglia, which are not the parts of your brain you want driving your decisions. When your brain stops using the prefrontal cortex, you might become more impulsive, more irritable, more easily angered, and less rational, which might explain why some of your interactions during the height of the pandemic might have been, let's just say, emotionally charged. So it may seem like this is all really bad news, but here's why this can be really good to know. When you recognize your body's natural response to stress, bad news, and uncertainty, you can start extending grace and compassion to yourself and others. And that pause may be the key to getting out of the stress cycle and getting regulated again. According to Dr. Amy Arnested at Yale University, there's a few simple things you can do to help your brain manage the increased stress and uncertainty you might be feeling. Take a deep breath. Exercise, which fun fact, strengthens your prefrontal cortex. Limit your time consuming the news. Set realistic expectations of yourself and others. Talk with others, help others, and find beauty in nature. Notice that talking with others or helping others are key parts of regulating your brain. So if you're feeling out of sorts, pause, take a breath, 
and reach out to God and others. That's science, and that's what's happening in your brain. What a story. Mm. Man, like I remember when we first talked with Adrian about this and we asked him like, what did you learn from this experience? And his answer was really simple, but so powerful because he just said, God and people really got me through. And I just thought about how true that is. Like when you go through your hardest moments, it really is God and others who make all the difference. Yeah, totally. And plants. Like whatever plants you can find on the island. Just okay. To eat. Okay. Like, why? Why are you not like? I mean, animals are good to eat too. You no, know? I'm not going to eat an animal. <laughs> then I would have to figure out how to kill them. I'm not going to kill an animal okay, with my okay. bare hands. All right, this is getting all right. Okay. Okay. So, on <laughs> crisis, <laughs> I think the other thing from his story that just like kind of hit me between the eyes was loneliness. Because hmm. yeah. isn't that like one of the hardest parts of crisis? Is you feel stuck and alone and like yeah. how can I make it mm-hmm. and so then it made me think of a moment when I experienced that we'd gone to see family for Christmas and Christy had a miscarriage and it was mm-hmm. a really hard time yeah. so normally we would have gone to see the other family the next year but we went back because we we're like we want to redeem it and have a mm-hmm. good time so we did and we had a great time seeing her family and we're driving home halfway across the country mm-hmm. and coming around a turn our our van is full of our kids and our Christmas presents and our new dog, and we roll and wreck. Oh my gosh. We're hanging from our seatbelts. Mm. I'm like, is everyone okay? We had been going highway speed, 70 miles an hour, mm. and everyone is okay. We mm. People immediately are banging on the windows, getting us out of the van. Oh we get out of the van. Well, my dog has made a run for it, and mm. he's gone. And I just look, I make a visual, look at my kids, make sure they're okay, look Mm. at my wife, she's okay. And I start running down the highway to go find my dog. I run Mm. up into the woods, like in the middle of the mountains, and I'm running from rock to rock, and I just find myself, I'm reciting Psalm 23. Mm. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, I will fear no evil. Your Mm. rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And it just came out. Like mm. I, I didn't know it was in there. That idea of hiding scripture mm. inside, uh, it works and it comes out when you need it. And people show up when you need them. Mm. Strangers on the side of the road, a truck driver put my kids in his truck. Mm. Strangers came and helped us. Obviously, an ambulance came and helped us. My in-laws mm. drove hours to come pick us up. Sue and Oscar and my my sisters, Stacy and Rachel, Chris, my wife's sisters, Went to go help us find the dog the next few days. Some Mm. random lady posted it on Facebook and it went viral on half of the state. I'm not kidding. Was looking for our dog. We're on the local news. Two and a half days later, this lady who all she does is finds dogs that have been in wrecks, finds our dog because like all these truckers are calling each other and people are posting on Facebook. They find our dog and he's fine. Someone who found out about it without asking posted a GoFundMe and people bought us a new van. So yeah, God and people. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So all of that gets me thinking about Jesus, right? And the night he's betrayed, he invites all of his disciples to come with him, you know, and he says, like, keep watch and pray. And I think it's just this idea that even Jesus, on one of the hardest nights of his life where he's, like, praying and, like, sweating blood, wanted his friends nearby. Yeah. And— his friends didn't like fully come through. I mean, do you remember? He looks and they're sleeping. They're like not there. And so right. people are not always going to show up the way God does. And that's right. okay. We still need them to show up. We still need to ask them to show up. And sometimes we might not know how to support people the right, right way in crisis. And scripture talks about makes this kind of simple. Let's rejoice with people who are rejoicing and weep with people who are weeping. You don't have to have all the right answers. We just need to show up and try to understand what they're feeling and feel with them. Yeah. 
So all of this brings me back to our whole theme of this season, which is just finding ways to cultivate meaningful, multi-generational, diverse friendships who will be with you in the highs and lows of life. And Adrian's story and your story reminds us why we need those people and how we can be those friends to other people who are going through a tough time. Right. So since we're at the end of this season where we're talking all about relationships, and then relationships are so much about meaningful conversations with people. So we've made a bunch of extra questions for you. So here are today's big questions to help you start those conversations and talk about them with your friends and your life group and your family. And hey, like find a stranger to talk about (laughs) these with if you want. What do you want to be true of you and the way that you've lived your life in the middle of the crisis? And how can you both receive and give support to others in times of crisis? But then here's some other bigger questions that you can ask yourself as you finish this season. How am I doing at building and maintaining diverse, multi-generational relationships? And what next step do I need to take to get there? And what perspectives might I be missing from my life? that I can learn from? And how will I find those perspectives or those people and invite them into my life? And then finally, how can my relationships make a difference in my community and not just benefit me personally? Those are a lot of questions, but I think it's really important after a season all about relationships to really enter those conversations and do the hard work of figuring it out because relationships will take work, but we know that they are always worth it. Yes, they are. friends, we've been talking about relationships all season long, and we want to encourage you to use this episode to build the relationships you have in your life. Remember, we don't want you to just listen to the podcast. Our hope is that you turn it into a conversation with someone you care about. So today, seriously, like right now, send this episode to a friend or your life group and then talk about it. We've even got a conversation guide for you in the show notes to get you started. And if you enjoyed today's episode, would you take a second to leave a rating and review? It really does help more people find the podcast. Have a great week. 